Hey, what's up, y'all? Will here at Schedule Fly, and this is our third episode of Rockstar Women of Restaurants. Somehow, I I messed up, and I got I got 35 minutes of this recorded audio and video. I did not realize until an hour, no, 30 minutes into this thing, 40 minutes into this thing, I didn't realize it wasn't recording. I totally messed up. So it's unfortunate because it's such a great conversation with these three ladies. I learned a ton. They learned from each other. They enjoyed each other's company. It was just great flow, great chemistry. So I had to put this on here and let you know why, because it just starts like randomly, just, you know, Carol Lee Fowler from Taco Boys in the middle of, of, of uh, telling about tech, talking about technologies and stuff. But so it's Carol Lee Fowler of Taco Boy, Wiki Wiki Sandbar. Her, her business is called All Good Industries. She's in Charleston, South Carolina. Very amazing lady uh, and has multiple different concepts. Been in the business a long time, just super sharp. Uh, and then we have Jess Killeen, who's out in Durango, Colorado. Uh, she has uh, Grassburger there in Durango and also there in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, Jess was on for part of a, another uh, episode. Uh, and uh, just so nice and so kind and, and came into this business not being a restaurant uh, owner, being a, an art historian, but did it for uh, family health initially. So she's got a great story. Uh, she's on here as well. And then Ashley Padgett, who's with Allison's Restaurant in Kenny Bunkport, that restaurant's been there for 40 or 50 years, family run, third generation. Uh, she's third generation. She runs that place. Oh man, I'm really bummed that we missed the intros in the first part, but I got to get over it. And uh, so we pick up here and um, talking, Carolee is talking about technology and, you know, we, we talked so much about COVID and how to, you know, how they navigated through this, uh, the challenges, but also the, the sort of silver linings or blessings in disguise that came with COVID. And you learn a lot from these folks. So um, what we'll also do is as I mentioned, I think I think while we were still recording, I mentioned to these ladies, uh, you know, we've got this group. We've now had nine or ten or eleven or twelve different uh, women on these episodes, these three episodes, and we're just going to start running this series and inviting more folks to join, but also having you know, cross pollination, whatever you want to call it, folks that have been on different ones and haven't met each other yet, or some that have been on one but want to continue conversation. So. Um, if you are, if you are part of the schedule fly network, uh, of customers and you're a female owner and you'd like to be, um, you know, on one of these, please reach out to me and let me know. Um, easiest way is my cell 704-906-2031, or you can email us at support at schedulefly.com and I'll get that. And, uh, that's it. So thanks for listening y'all and watching. All right. See Looking at trying to make sure our online ordering was really up to snuff and how was our website? I mean, it just really sent us into a tailspin about our technology and where we'd been slow to develop uh, and adopt, or not develop, but adopt new technology in the past. This year, we've just been forced to do it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and never before, I think, would we have examined our POS platform to identify how integral it could be with these other things, I do, like delivery, events, ticketing, um, uh, or, or run, or actually, could it possibly run our own delivery? Does how does it, in a, in a, you know, how does it um, communicate to our customers? Um, so that's been a big part of it for us is just identifying where is technology going to make this better for the customer and easier for us to operate. And I, and I love how Danny Meyer always says, you know, adopting technology for technology's sake is just a waste of time and money but adopting technology to help make the guest experience better is always a solid move. And I think we found that this year too. That is so true. All of our objectives that we had set for the year just went out the window with COVID and it became, it, it came, it became about innovating and how to deal with delivery and um, curbside and the takeout and our, our paper products. I mean, everything just, we zoned, we zoned in on it and, our biggest challenge, so we've, we, and we had been toying with the idea of doing delivery. And like you, we really, I don't know how many times we sat down and tried to figure out how to do it organically because we just couldn't stomach the idea of hiring the 
delivery companies, their fees are so high, but in the end, we just didn't have the bandwidth resources. We've just never really been able to figure out how to make it work because it's not our business model and mm-hmm. you know, we have other priorities. So we ended up going with DoorDash and honestly, in the Albuquerque market with the stores closed, it, I mean, it, it kept our customer base satisfied. You know, it kept us out there, but the 26% fee also was a huge blow to our, I mean, there were some months where really we were just open for, you know, because of the delivery and, and paying for the delivery, but we felt like it kept us moving along in that market and gave us, gave us an option. I'm hoping at some point there'll be regulation that will cap those fees because there isn't anything right now. And, and it's really, it's really painful for restaurants. Um, Anyway, the, the, our biggest snarl is curbside. Like we have so much trouble and we have been, we've been really looking to technology to solve that. And we haven't found anything yet that, that has, is working and that's been able to integrate with our POS system well enough. What, that what do y'all use right now, POS wise? Toast is the system we use. Do you guys use that, either of you? Mm-mm. No, okay. but that was the other one we would have used because it felt like, a lot of the business owners here, like, um, like will like Lewis barbecue and a lot of other, um, models here in Charleston, um, that do a heavy amount of carry out and are less, you know, if it's not table service, but more care, you know, counter or otherwise they love toast because of the automated messaging features and uh, all those things that from, from their perspective, say, make it much easier to communicate to the guests to make that more seamless. Yeah. Oh, overall, we've been happy with it. Were you going to say something, Allison? Mm-mm. No, I was agreeing. Many, many local businesses use toast and love it. Um, we do not. That's all I was. Yeah. They, well, they're fast. They seem to be working pretty quickly to integrate to and keep up with the technology demands in the market. But, uh, you know, they can be clunky too, but this curbside piece, we just haven't been able to solve to. We're looking for a uh, program that will track the cars so we know that they're out there because when you leave it to people our experience anyway like we even with toast with the automatic they're getting messages on their phone they're getting email messages call this particular number they pull up there's a sign outside that says call or text this number they're still calling the store (laughs) they're going going, we're out here where are you right and everybody's flying around doing their thing and they're not community so leaving it to that human element is where we just run into trouble so is all of the like the online ordering everything's integrated through toast right there's not a separate piece yeah he's pause attached so we just we were using a thing called table up that integrated with our pos they just sold to um one of the other pos companies i can't remember what so we just switched to something called to go tech um, but I don't think you would have that option because of toast. No, but to go you, to a lot of good curbside. Things. This is a seg, but are you still canning? Are you, I saw on your website that you have canned. We are the place that we use in Massachusetts actually shut down for COVID and then basically completely shut down. So we, um, since November, we have not, we're trying to find other, another company or, um, actually do, do any of you ship food to either of you? No. Oh, you do? Because that's something we are really looking into just doing it ourselves versus, you know, sending our recipes and having it done elsewhere. Hmm. All right. When I, we ship our hot sauce. So that sounds different from what, what you're talking about, but are you referring to something like a gold belly or anything like that? Yeah, we've looked into gold belly. Um, ours is more our clam chowder and, and lobster bisque and things like that. But um, yeah, that is kind of an avenue of growth we were hoping for that we can keep in-house and still grow the business. It makes so much sense. I was really surprised how much hot sauce we started to send around the country, you know, within just a few days of putting it online. I, it was kind of, we th- kind of thought it would just be a fun thing to do on the side, but it's, it's grows every month. Do you and, use a separate shipping company and everything, or do you do everything in-house? We actually have a local can a local um, food company that we've that we fine tuned the the recipe with. Um, they produce it, bottle it, label it for us, and then our local food our local um, produce um, purveyor 
stocks it for us so that we can ship it to the stores so that our stores have it. And then we buy, then we have, they also send us the bulk packages of um, the hot sauce. And we have one location that handles all the online retail um, and that we use the like ship station and, um, and we do our own shipping right now. Okay. Yeah. But it's been really easy. Ship station has been really easy because you can just um, between ordering, having all the shipping stuff available for us, um, then it, we print the labels here and then it, we can schedule any of the delivery companies to come pick it up. We don't ever have to leave the business to do it. How have you, how have you marketed the hot sauce, Carolee? I mean, there's so many hot sauces. Like, how, how did you establish the brand outside of just, you know, your footprint? It's just the fish in the barrel captive audience that we have at the restaurants, really, right? So if they've had it at the restaurant, then it's an easy thing for them to, to send out or send as a, a return souvenir or wish you were here kind of type of gift for people. We also find that a lot of times people who leave, who move Charleston, um, come back to our websites to send gifts out to people and things like that. So we haven't really, we're really changing. That's the other thing about COVID. I feel like it completely changed how we wanted to talk to our customers new and, and, and potential customers and existing customers. We've decided to spend 80% of any marketing dollars that we were going to have back on the experience for the guests inside the businesses. So really trying to make sure that we were marketing in the business first and foremost, and then spending about 20% of our efforts on attracting new customers. But um, we're, we were really kind of getting caught up in, in all the ways to try to get people to us when COVID happened. And then it, and it seemed like from an execution standpoint, we were really struggling. And so that was, you know, I, I feel like COVID's the great clarifier. And, and that was one of the things that we, we decided for ourselves ultimately. Great yeah, exactly right. That's a really good way to put it. Mm -hmm. It's really uh, as horrible as it's been for so many reasons and for so many people and so many businesses um, getting hopefully the other side of this um, at some point here, um, certainly the lights at the end of the tunnel. Well, there's, I mean, I'm hearing this, we've touched on this, but there's silver linings that blessings in disguise, whatever you want to call it, that we'll probably look back on from this that perhaps made everybody's business ultimately better. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I just felt like very expensive lessons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were. That's true. <laughs> yeah, we just realized, I mean, we used to be open from, you know, we'd open at 11 a.m. and we were the last ones. We were closing at 1 a.m. We served food till midnight. And this summer with all the restrictions, we couldn't do that. And, and we realized um, we were making just as much money closing at 9 p.m. Hmm. without all the late night hassle and the staffing and all of that. So there's just been so many little streamlining changes that we've decided to make going forward. That makes oh. total sense. One thing that I also came to mind when we were talking about delivery was that as painful as those fees have been for us, I think market share has been keeping market share in this time last year when, when you know, through this last year has been imperative to staying alive, to staying alive. What we've noticed for restaurants who, who did not try to serve their customers at all during this time, I mean, we have restaurants that were just saying they're not going to reopen until their entire teams can be vaccined, vaccinated, excuse me. And, um, but what we found that, that if you did that, your market share dropped and somebody else was scooping it up. And so that it might, it, those fees, I think, might have been worth it just to make sure that your customers were being serviced by you versus somebody else. Yeah, we've always closed for the month of January forever. And this year we were just so afraid of falling off the map a little bit, even for a month. Um, just, you know, people change and start ordering someplace else and they get comfortable with that um, and habits change so quickly. Um, I, I really love the idea of what you're doing this summer, Carolee. One of the challenges, and I, I don't operate a restaurant, so I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'll, I always struggle with just the, conceptually the idea of losing the losing the customer experience once we hand off something to some driver from some other business that has no you know connection 
to, to ours. We actually had a bad experience, you know, with one of these third party deliveries um, several months ago and it reflected poorly on the restaurant, which it shouldn't, but it does, um, you know, uh, those are rare right? and, you know, and, and those delivery services do a good job of, of training their folks, I think by and large, but I always struggle with that concept of, and we're so protective of that here at Schedule Five. like we want to, that's why we don't do integration with toast. Like we, we want to be able to control that experience beginning to end, right? It's, it's so important to know it's a totally different business. I get that. But um, I wonder if there will be more operators that will start to fit. Not everybody can do it with golf carts on an island, but, you know, figure out ways. Like that's a cool model with the truck. There's ways to do that where you can control that experience because now this person is showing up on the doorstep representing your brand fully, right? And that experience is so much more meaningful to the customer than this middle person, if you will. Does that make sense? Totally. And um, I don't know if they use schedule flight. Do you, um, do you have a customer called Verde in Charleston? V-E-R-D-E? -E. Uh, yeah. I don't think so, but I'm not, I'm not positive. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be talking to her. We'll see if we can't get him up. But, <laughs> but um, my girlfriend, Jen Farabee has this uh, salad company that um, salads and sandwiches and soups at the end of the day. And, um, and there, I think she's got six units all over the South, you know, this region. And she had that same heartburn mm -hmm. and um, at the end of the day, decided she was going to start her own and, and really uh, did some smart stuff and she's a real innovative thinker and, and tenacious. And, and so I appreciate like she does when she decides to set out to do something, she doesn't stop until it's done, no matter how many iterations they have to come up with. And they, she ended up call, creating something called fresh to desk. And uh, when I talked to her the other day, she said, they're going to start to grow it as its own business. But ultimately she created a platform uh, for schools, for uh, office buildings. And I think it's modeled off of something that happens in Charlotte actually well, um, cause they did have a location in Charlotte okay. and, um, and so, you know, she just created really good marketing materials, collateral that explained what they were going to be willing to do. Everybody had to have their orders in by 9. AM. If they, if the orders were in by nine, it was what their team was doing before the actual store was open. And then they would send a delivery driver, sometimes her, sometimes, you know, different people in the organization to go deliver 25, 30, 40 orders at a time to these facilities, these businesses. And it was so smart. Um, she could control everything. And, and, to, and to your point about quality, she would know right away if they'd really met the mark. And now she's looking at expanding it and offering, offering her current customer base to other trusted brands to participate in. And the first criteria she said was, there's going to be a, a period of time, you know, a trial period for each of these brands. Can they execute to the level that we want them to? Um, and I, th I thought that was really smart, but it was a, you know, it was an innovative approach and in thinking about um, those facilities where people have to make decisions about lunch before maybe their kids come in the classroom or before they get into their morning meetings and, and how smart that was to, to identify how she could to serve those, um, those groups. Yeah. People are so innovative and that I think to your point, to all of our points that has been a positive part of COVID. Like just letting, I mean, we've had to pivot and we've had to be creative and we've had, and it's allowed us to streamline in some cases and work smarter, not harder. And, you know, and um, there's a woman in Durango who started an e-bike uh, delivery service just over the summer, but she would go to one restaurant each night of the week. And um, anyway, and it was, so I just loved her creativity and it was fun for the community. And that worked well in a, you know, place this size. Um, it hit a segment of the population that, you know, that really likes um, the more of the locals kind of thing. But I just, I thought it was really neat that she was out there doing it. She was on her e-bike. She would come by and, <laughs> and the restaurants that were open were participating on a, on a, um, scheduled basis and you know we'd hand her our big bag stick it on the back of the bike it was fun so that's really are... cool yeah the innovation is so big i mean i i get why you'd say I, you hope that these bees are capped and stuff jess the other side is that there's such an opportunity for somebody to do this in a 
you know, look, I mean, you're particularly y'all like, you, you know, you're independent operators. You're, you're, this is why we love serving y'all. You're, you're so, it's so different than what you might get with a, you know, big massive chain. You, the experience that we have with you and your people and that, that personal connection is such an integral part of what you do and the value proposition that you provide. So there's, there's hopefully opportunities, you know, I'm not the person, but for people to start to figure out like what your friend's doing here later to bridge that gap and to have that, that re you know, the technology is great with like Uber Eats and some of these other ones, that's the technology piece is cool. But, but that personal experience you have with the independent operator is so important to most of our, most of your guests, as you know, um, it matters to them. So maybe there's opportunities for people to find ways to provide a better service with, you know, um, a different way to monetize them. I don't know. I hope so. I think there's a, there's a market for it. Y'all are every single person I've talked to has brought up 30% or 28% or, you know, I mean, every single one, it's a tough nut for sure. I have to scoot real quick. I'm sorry, y'all, but um, I wanted to ask um, both of you, have you, if y'all um, looked into the ERTC, the employee retention credit, are you working on that or? We have no. not. It's a huge amount of money. And, oh. it, and, it, and I wanted to relay that because there, I feel like most people's CPAs have not done the deep dive like we all did, they did with the PPP. And we did not find out through it by our CPAs or by our financial advocates. We found out about it through other restaurateurs. And, and, I, and I, I would feel remiss by not relaying that because the law changed on December 27th. And if you had taken PPP money before that, you couldn't also be eligible for the employee retention credit. They changed that. And now, as long as you're not using PPP to pay payroll, you can. Um, apply for those credits and they can be retroactive for 2020 in the form of a lump sum check back from the IRS. And for many, for most organizations that I know it's six figures per store. Wow. So it's, it's significant. And I would, it, I would definitely recommend um, talking to your payroll companies about it. They know more than most CPAs, but we kind of ended up leaning back on our CPAs and saying, dive into this and you have to tell us how to manage this because that's not what we do. Okay. You know? Hmm. But if you are currently using PPP for payroll, you can't do that because we are. Right. So okay. you, can't you can't double dip, but you can go back and say, like, say you ran out of PPP money in August or September of last year, mm -hmm. there's a full quarter and a half where you can go back and get a significant credit. Mm -hmm. um, or even for the weeks that you didn't use it before you got the second round this year. I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I can't express it enough how important it is. ERT. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Right? Yeah, the employee retention credit. So we always call it the ER. We're always giving it different acronyms. But oh. yeah, the ER, employee retention credit, ERC is what it is. Okay. Um, and entrepreneur.com um, has a really good, if you Google, you know, employee retention credit and entrepreneur.com, they had a really great uh, posting about it that, that went super in depth on it, how to do it, who's, and, 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 and I think given the fact that it sounds like you're both are under, um, still under government regulation restrictions to your business, you'd be at you, that's one of the, you know, there's several requirements, but as long as you're under a, a restriction, um, by based on the government, you're eligible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Thank Carolina, I know you got to go. We're coming this summer back to for family vacation. So I want to meet you and hang with you. This Absolutely. Right. Send me a text. We'll figure it out. All right, cool. Ladies, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to connecting again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank Absolutely. you. I really enjoyed meeting both of you. Yeah, and I'm, I think we'll, you, we've sent all of our information out. So feel free to reach out anytime also. Awesome. Thank and you. vice versa. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Jess, Ashley, anything else y'all want to rap about? No, I've just really, I've enjoyed meeting you so much, Ashley. You've got a, um, I did look at your website, really impressive business. And, um, and I love that. I love the history of it. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. There's not many other places in town, you know, we're coming up on 50 years, which is unbelievable. Um, yeah. Obviously, I haven't been here the whole time. 
I hope it's obvious. <laughs> You're at the helm of a legacy business. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's a lot to shoulder as well, but it's, um, it, it's just a wonderful blessing. I couldn't be happier. Thank you. Oh. And now you guys have to come to Kenny Monk Port. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Durango. Oh, oh. Durango, yes. <laughs> oh, you know, and where, where Carolee is too, y'all all live in wonderful places. Um, Ashley, uh, I just, I, thank you for bringing up what you did. I know that's hard. You've had a, I mean, oh. gosh, your year, you know, I, I tip my hat. Um, okay. you, you've had a lot on you. And uh, I don't know how y'all, one of the things that's always fascinated me about restaurant owners is just how how you are able to stay. It, it, I'm sure it's hard, uh, and it's not always the case. But how you stay calm through these storms? Um, it is such. I mean, you're dealing just on a daily basis with more fires and em, employee substance abuse issues that we talk. I mean, all this stuff. I mean, just before all COVID hit, it's it's a really unique personality I think you have to have in this set of skills or this stack of talents you have to have to to navigate just owning a restaurant in general it's it, it I always I commend you all for doing what you do uh and then to go through COVID and then to go through the you know what you addressed man uh it just I uh I'm in awe of what y'all are able to, to accomplish um I have really worked over the years with trying to figure out ways to stay, find inner peace and stay calm um, to the point that I even like turn the shower water cold when I'm getting a shower now at the end of like cold water shock there. It works, I mean, but like, how do you do that? Like, is it part of your nature or have you had to look, I mean, Jess, you didn't come into this as a restaurant person. So there may have been some shocks to you just by you know all that comes along with it but i'm just so fascinated with that idea and how you're able to find that sense of calm through daily and stresses of the business but then things like covid as well have you been reading wim hof do you know who that is i know wim yeah yeah <laughs> we're, we're devoted <laughs> I don't, I don't read, I haven't read Wim Hof, but I've known about Wim Hof because I've been following Laird Hamilton, the surfer for a long time. And, and uh, that's how I learned about him. I've got a friend that does Wim Hof reading um, okay. this morning, actually. Um, but, uh, but no, it, I think that there's a lot to that. Um, absolutely. Yeah, Ashley, he does. Uh, he's a, he's a big, uh, he's a proponent of deep breathing and breathing to, to increase your carbon dioxide intake. It's a whole science and then, but the cold shower thing and the ice baths are um, a big part of his science. And my I husband's super into that part, but. <laughs> so yeah, I've been trying to end my showers with cold showers too and it's brutal. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that would not put me at peace at all. <laughs> oh, but it's surprising and actually, you can attest to this, right? Well, it feels good. Like if you can do it, yeah. it actually, you come out warmer somehow. Don't you think? Well, like when you, you I'm sorry, we have a, our a installers here. So our, you're going to, and I'm working from home. You can hear my dogs. They're about to explode. <laughs> sorry. My, that, my husband just poked his head in here and said, I'm just warning you. The, uh, <laughs> That's okay. We can write. About, so uh, I do, I do, uh, <laughs> I will attest, it is very hard. And if the first time you do it, you, you do it for half a second, you scream. Yeah. Uh, you go cold and you just go, ah, and, and then you, but you gradually, like now I can do it and you get to the first few seconds and then you just kind of, I mean, I don't, it, it stinks every time and I have to talk myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then afterwards, I'm like, I feel so good. Like, it's amazing. It's weird. Yeah. Wait, so check him out. He's legit. I, I mean, he's like, yeah, he's he it down. Yeah, he climbed Mount Everest uh, wearing like shorts. He's like, great. Yeah, my husband much. started running in the. You know, it's cold here. He's been yeah. running in shorts, and anyway, it's he's cool. But you know, I thank you for asking that question because that that how to manage stress in this industry is something that I, I really struggled with, especially going into it. Um, it just it ate me alive those first couple of years. And I think I said this last time we talked, 
I, I mean, I didn't see my older, my kids for, I feel like for like two years, I feel like I missed their, what was happening. I was just so, I was at the restaurant all the time or, or if I wasn't, you know, there were always little fires to put out. The phone was always ringing. It just was, it was really hard. And part of our evolution has been how to grow the business, but not kill ourselves in the process. And one of my resources, which I'm actually rereading again right now is E-Myth Revisited. I don't know if you guys have read that book, but it changed how I looked at our business. And it that whole work smarter, not harder piece that being able to rep, have people replicate what I was doing so that I didn't have to do everything all the time was a, was a game changer. And, um, and now after, and it has not been easy, but I do have boundaries in place and I'm, uh, and I'm also able to work from home sometimes, like not all, my work isn't all in the restaurant anymore. And, um, and that was really hard at first, like, like really hard, harder than you would think, because I like being in the restaurant. And I felt like if I wasn't there, I wasn't really working, but all those other things that you have to work on in order to make your business better or to innovate, or it's hard to do that when you're on the floor all the time. And when you're, you know, dealing with an order not coming in on, or an order is coming in and you're, I mean, I found it very clarifying to make that, make that change as hard as it was. Um, anyway. E-Myth is something that uh, is, uh, that's interesting you brought that up. We actually did a podcast episode recently hmm. um, with a young man who is starting a restaurant and then Chris Dickerson, who's been a customer for a while and very, very successful. And he's used a lot of the principles from E-Myth Revisited. So it's come up multiple times uh, over the years. I have some friends that are really uh, uh, are big on that book as, as well. Um, yeah. Definitely worth checking out. Anybody that happens to be listening to this, um, well, Ashley, how do you do it? You've been you grew up in the business, so maybe the challenges you know were were. I mean, you kind of knew what you were getting into, but sorry, I'm writing a check. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Case in point, you got to write a check. You got so much going on. You got to say. <laughs> that about sums it up, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. You know, I actually have some of my leader leadership group right now. Um, we're having a Zoom call in a week or two, and I'm having them read some excerpts from it because I have a couple store managers who are doing themselves what they need to have their staff doing with the belief that they, only they can do it. Do you know what I mean? And I want them to read the EMET Revisit of these sections so that they understand part of their job is to train the staff to do the way they would do it. And so that they don't, it's, they're not always on the line and, you know, and that leads to that balance part that we're talking about. Cause if, if we have store managers that are burning out, that's why they, you know, they need to train to delegate and train with the expectation that everybody will do it the way they would do it into our standards. So anyway. Yeah. And just accepting um, the way that other people do it. I'm kind of a perfectionist. So that has been a struggle in, you know, building a team and, and giving up some of the, the responsibilities and things like that. I've definitely gotten better at that. Um, and the whole learning to say no. I mean, I'm also, um, I get asked to do stuff a lot just as a business owner and I have a very hard time saying no. I just accepted the presidency of the uh, local chamber of commerce <laughs> against my better judgment, you know, and that takes up a lot of time and I do lots of volunteer work and I need to learn to step back a little bit. Um, and I think I have this year um, and just try to focus, you know, you have to focus more on the business, uh, but definitely giving up some of the, the responsibilities um, is, is huge and hard for some people. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's, there's a, a blog post a guy named Derek Sivers wrote probably a decade ago. And I think of it often. Uh, and it's something that's really helped me guide a lot of decisions. Not always, but he, uh, he says that he decides to commit to things by answering a quick question when somebody asks him to do something. He says it's either hell yes or no. So it's literally, you can look up a blog, hell yes or no. That's it. It's what is his initial response? 
If it's hell yes, then he's going to do it. If, if mm. it's not, if it's not, then the answer is by default, no. Um, That's so simple, bad. not hard, not easy to execute on, but it does really help clarify a lot of those things I've noticed for myself over the years of like, I used to have too many things. I was like, yeah, I felt like I should because of my ass, but then you can't really commit yourself. And then you feel bad about like, I don't feel like I'm doing a good job and I need to because I'm, and I'm stressed. And then like, Ugh, like, that's not good for anybody. Right? And to your point, Jess, you know, the teach a man to fish versus, you know, um, feed a man to fish, right? So that's the, uh, your staff, your, your managers are feeding them versus the teaching them. Teaching's leverage, right? I mean, the teaching is a lever because, you know, same with parenting or whatever, you know. And um, in our business, that's how you deepen the bench. Yeah. You know, to be, I mean, it's yeah. wonderful to be able to hire and promote from within, but they, people need to be taught. And so. Yeah. Um, let me ask you one more thing. I meant to ask this earlier and I, it, cause it was in the context of what we were talking about, but I'm just curious if you are, um, starting to see this trend and that's uh what you may call spiritless cocktails um this would go this would tie into the you know substance abuse piece of this but there seems to be a, a more and more that i'm seeing with bartenders that are uh working with you know making creative drinks that are not that don't have alcohol mocktails mocktails yeah yeah, that's definitely growing. And with younger people, which is kind of, I guess, inspiring that that is the trend. Um, but yeah, that's definitely growing and something we've been working on. Yeah, it still allows for a lot of creativity and fun, but just not, you know, the... Almost more creativity because you have to make it taste good without, you know... <laughs> right. <laughs> something fancy without alcohol in it. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Y'all, I really really appreciate this. I learned so much when I do these things and I feel like it's selfish in some ways, but I hope it's worth your time too. I hope you all enjoyed this um, and learn from each other because it, it is just such a wonderful opportunity for us to do this. So I really appreciate it a lot. Thank you. We, thank you. And I, we, I think we, well, I feel the same. Well, I think it's really cool that you're pulling these together and I'm so enjoying getting to meet other women in the industry there. I mean, you, you, are so impressive what you're doing. And I, I have in this, this is the second one. I know I had to leave the other one early, but in both of them, I've learned so much. I've taken notes and I've gotten to follow up on this. And thank you for the hell yes or no too. That yeah, was a good check one. That out. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to remember that forever. <laughs> that and cold power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> well, uh, uh, well, on that note, I'll let y'all roll in off it, but thank you. We'll keep these going. Uh, I'll just kind of, I'm going to start kind of building a list of all of y'all that have been on them or ones I hope will be on them. And, and we'll just have, you know, and we'll just kind of keep these rolling and you can join anytime you want and meet other ladies or keep, keep the conversation going. Uh, so we, we appreciate it. And y'all have a good day, nice weekend. And uh, if y'all ever need anything, you, uh, you know where I'm at. Thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you. Or both of you, Will. I mean, we've talked, but we've never actually seen each other. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day and weekend, you, you two. You too. Bye. See you.